This episode of Twin Cities Trekkies is brought to you by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor before, let me explain. First of all, it's free. There are creation tools that help you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can easily make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. They'll also help you to distribute your podcast so it can be heard on many different platforms such as Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's all you need in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome, everyone, to episode eight of Twin Cities Trekkies. I am Wes. And I'm Kenzie. And, and I'm Tishale. Yep. And yeah, today we're going to be talking about the tribbles of Star Trek. And as you just heard, uh, we have a special guest today, Tishale, um, one, of McKenzie, one of McKenzie's friends who also is a big fan of Star Trek. So welcome to Twin Cities Trekkies, Tishale. Thanks for having me. Um, before we before we get into the topic about uh, Tribbles, uh, why don't we let the listeners know about your Star Trek story? Sure. Um, well, it's a, a bit of a long one, but I'll, I'll try to keep it succinct. Um, obviously, my name is Tishale, and it comes from a Star Trek book that is written by a wonderful woman named uh, Margaret Wander Bonanno. Uh, it's called Dwellers in the Crucible. Uh, the character is a Vulcan um, envoy of the planet who uh, actually takes Ambassador Spock's place in Starfleet as uh, sort of a uh, representative of Vulcan, uh, since he is off doing his own thing in Starfleet. Um, and yeah, she's a recurring character in the books. Uh, my dad is a huge Trek fan, has been watching it ever since it started airing in the 60s, and I was kind of destined from birth to be a Trek fan, so here I am. Awesome. And our families are intertwined that way as well, because I, that's how our parents know each other and how we learn to know each other, too, is through Star Trek. Yeah, my uh, dad founded a uh, Star Trek fan club in our hometown called Trekadence, uh, which uh, Kenzie's parents were a part of, as well as some extended aunts and uncles that I still have in my life today. Yeah, that's awesome, Tishel. That's awesome. Um, I'm glad to know about your Star Trek story because, I mean, Grant, I learned a bit more from when we did our Star Trek stories on the very first episode of this podcast about a month ago um, doing that. So that's awesome that... uh, that that your story is like intertwined with Mackenzie's. That's awesome. I mean, that's that's perfectly great. So um, yeah, that's awesome. I didn't know. I, I'm a. I mean, Margaret Warner Bonanno. That is that's awesome. That's she's an awesome Trek author. Um, oh, I know. Yeah, I love her books. <laughs> yeah, like I mean, I'm a. I mean, I haven't read one of her books, but I know one of them is Strangers in the Sky, which was actually about the Vulcan first contact before first contact came out. Yeah. And that can do. Yeah. Yeah. She, she has a good hand in a a lot of the canon, as far as I understand it. Um, From what I can tell uh, her and a lot of the other fan and authors are it's into uh, what we would consider kind of the star Wars extended universe is a lot of the uh, it's not technically within the sphere of the storytelling by Gene Runder and the other uh, directors, but it is, sort of extended canon which I, I find really interesting yeah I think like extended extended canon and the whole definition of canon is such an interesting topic in any fandom like uh, what is considered canon is it original creator and that's that's the final say and then the case of Star Trek where Gene Roddenberry of course passing away after some time even though he started kind of passing that baton on um is it, just kind of an interesting um continuation of just seeing what what, how people run with what is canon and what isn't so a lot of the books I feel like in both like Star Trek and Star Wars it's like a lot of people will argue back and forth of is this canon is this not so it's it's cool to see like like that your origin story of your name coming from a book that has a, a ton of content around it and seeing how people treat that as whether or not it's like canon or not like still respected highly 
yeah especially when there's a lot of discussion nowadays even about the reboots that are coming out now like things like picard and like discovery where a lot of people will even yeah you know old school fans are saying oh that's not like real trek even though you know we've trek has always been an evolving thing so it's really interesting especially when you get into like the literature side of stuff like how far a lot of those people will argue that canon stretches so it's it's pretty cool yeah that's that's awesome uh yeah i mean you know some of the book like material has made it into canon um like for example um the black fleet of klingon ships um that was mentioned in the first episode of discovery that actually came from a book published in the 80s um which was nice uh, to see that if it was like it was it predated like a lot of things before next generation so like that kind of thing so that's awesome um that we got all this like i, I consider some of the books, books canon um like the autobiographies obviously um like that recently have come out in the last few years i mean granted some of it is probably like conjecture now because of like especially the picard one um i have i own that one so the picard autobiography like some of the things are probably like not even worth it not even mentioned anywhere anymore but definitely um because i the reason why i mentioned that is because uh the spock one is coming out this year so which is nice oh yeah Yeah. i'm excited about that yeah it's coming out the day before the 50th anniversary so 55th anniversary of star trek so i'm kind of looking forward to seeing that so um yeah reading that book you know because i have two of them right now i want all four but uh, I have both the Picard one and the Janeway one. And there's only one that's an audiobook form, which is the Janeway one. And that's also voiced by Kit Mulgrew herself. Uh, she did the audiobook for it. So, which was nice to, uh, nice to see that happen, you know. I mean, I wonder if they're going to do the same thing with the uh, other ones, too. I wish that William Shatner and Patrick Stewart and whoever would do the Spock one, which will hopefully be Ethan Peck or Zachary Quinto. Uh, yeah. would do that one um and that's and because you know people enjoy audiobooks too for the experience of actually listening to the actor uh whoever uh, read the story you know mm-hmm. there's a ton of them yeah a ton of them but we're not Absolutely talking about love to hear uh adam nimoy read the uh yeah the oh song. yeah adam nimoy really of great. course yeah definitely you know because he did the for the love of spock documentary so um which by the way, is actually one of one of my favorite documentaries about Star Trek is the, is for the love of Spock. Um, oh, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing that one yet. Yeah, it's on Netflix to shale. So, you know, it, it, yeah, it was it was made it was it was made by Adam Nimoy, his son, um, something like that. I guess both of his children did documentaries about him. So I know that um, Julie, his daughter, did one for uh, about COPD, which he's what, what he died of um with the copd uh um and did one about that he, it came out about a year later after the love of Sp- for the love of spot came out um i know it's yeah. available on amazon prime i know that i mean i've been wanting, i've been meaning to watch it don't get me wrong because you know i mean and stuff like that and as we're recording this i know that uh was it the 26th which is like on thursday of this week uh the city of boston which is where learning Nemoy grew up is doing um learning Nemoy day so they proclaimed it Learn Emoy Day in honor of his night would, would have been his 90th birthday. So yeah, yeah so. it's it's crazy, you know. So, but anyway, enough about that. Uh, let's talk about the triples. <laughs> yeah. What an yeah. iconic, what an iconic species. Yeah. Favorite That's the one, level. the one thing I feel like beyond of like all Star Trek and getting anybody, whether or not they like Star Trek or not, know what triples are. 
absolutely it's like it's that uh green orion girls and uh probably like the ears on a vulcan and, like, yeah any, anybody in the world can spot those three things and go ah star trek exactly like yes <laughs> <laughs> Yes, definitely. Yeah, like the green, uh, the green Orions, the Tribbles, Klingons, Romulans. Those are all the iconic shows. Uh, Vulcans, obviously. Those are like the five like iconic uh, species of Star Trek. Oh, it was six. There's six. The Borg. I forgot the Borg. Oh, yeah, but, Borg are pretty <laughs> popular. I forgot the Borg. <laughs> so a lot so, of my friends don't know the difference between Romulans and Vulcans. It's like any of my friends see pointy ears. Like when I I brought one of my friends who's not really into Star Trek to watch the J.J. Uh, Abrams movies and being like, why are these Vulcans so mean? And it's like, oh boy, you should watch, <laughs> you should watch the series so that we can, we can go into that a little bit more because you're not wrong. They are one of the same in a way, but, but yeah. like, long, 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 long time ago. This, the lore you're tapping into. Like, oh, I can't, I can't answer this in quiet in a movie theater. We're going to talk about this later. I'm like, we got to keep going. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the Tribbles, they've always been featured heavily in four episodes, by the way, of Star Trek. And this is crazy because, you know, but they've made cameos other ways, too. They I mean yeah, was, mentions mentioned. Um, they've also, also the context like yeah. like I was thinking like well, I was like when's the first time they've actually like appeared in Star Trek and then I thought about it, I'm like well Enterprise I guess because Phlox like in passing has them and I was like does that count as the first time yeah. that uh, they're like shown or anything like he just has them as like a pet like as like food for his pets like and stuff and I'm like I like is that the first time that humans knew about them or were they just kind of a thing like before I that i suppose that's actually a good question because i recently watched uh the newest uh version of tribbles in star trek which is the short treks uh, the trouble with edward and um i was interested because i haven't actually watched a lot of short treks so i wonder where canonically it falls in the timeline because i think if it does come before enterprise that might technically be the first introduction of triples. yeah but it's like it's yeah it's confusing though because the thing that sets that apart is like at some point they genetically modified the triple to not be insanely like repopulating so it's like i i was wondering about that too because i, I had to re i had to watch that because i had never seen that short track and I, I love that uh um bob from bob's burgers is okay oh, yeah, i'm like <laughs> yeah like i was like heck yeah i'm like this is i'm already in love but um <laughs> i i um I was kind of like thinking about it because I'm like, so this would have, would this be after because, or like, is this a, a specific subspecies that they had safely like turned down their reproduction levels? Because that was the whole issue really at the beginning. Or is it like they're, they're pretty much harmless, except they're just an ecological disaster because of how quickly they reproduce. Like, it, and that's like the biggest issue. It's like they're not going to bite you. They might freak out if you're Klingon, but, uh, you know, they, for the most part, they, they're they pretty chill. And they make it humans feel nice because of their little cooing noises. Yeah, and according to Spock, you know, in The Trouble with Tribbles, he says they do have one redeeming characteristic. They don't talk too much. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, it was all a spec script originally by David Gerald. Um, you know, for the second season of Star Trek, he was a freelance writer at the time, and yeah, he created the Tribbles originally, you know, to be these furry, furry little animals. You know, and, so it, and he was, and when he was uh pitching this to Gene Kuhn, who was the producer of Star Trek at the time, uh, he said, like, he told people, like, I don't know if this is gonna sell, you know, and stuff like that, and you know. It's like, and it did, obviously. It's been one of the most popular episodes of Star Trek ever since. <laughs> you know, and, you know, it's it's crazy. Like, the trouble with Edward, Edward is one of my favorite short tracks because of the funny thing. I like the ending. The ending with the with the commercial. That's my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> the commercial with the triple cereal. It's so furry. It tickles. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only cereal with a revolutionary new use. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I love that commercial. I love that like, the fake commercial they made for it. You know, it was funny. It was it was great. And I, I know, there's one thing I wanted to know what 
what David Gerald thought of that. You know, I mean, that's one thing I actually thought about when I saw that for the first time was the trouble with Edward. I'm going like, yeah. is this what David Gerald would have liked for the troubles to be eaten by humans? Um, I mean, they 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 like nod to it. There's there's a, a next generation episode or one of the like food dishes where yeah. they're like at least or is what is the episode? At least we have at least we have Paris. Or something. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, so, I'm so terrible at remembering episode <laughs> names, but it's, it's okay. like one of the dishes, like at the cafes with Tribble. So I'm like, I, I think it's implied that people do eat them as like a, like I feel like that's how the conversation around Tribble starts. Where it's like, ooh, great idea. They're super easy. They're just born pregnant. Like at least like the one like before they their uh, their population efforts to like keep them from repopulating too quickly. They're, they're an easy food source, right? They just chill out and it's easy to use them as a food source. But, yeah. you know, I feel like that it's like a weird thing where it's like, um, is this right? Moral? Like, which yeah, I like. That's I, why I like that. Uh, trouble are with they Edward. intelligent? Do we know? We only know they don't have a face. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I love the take of like, are they intelligent? It's like, oh no, they can't, they can't get away from us. Like, we could, they're easy to hunt. It's like, no, I'm like, I'm literally talking like, is it shitty of us to like, you know, be, <laughs> to be, um, like eating these things, the like, are they sentient, like creatures? Do they deserve to live alongside us? Yeah, you know, it's crazy. Like, I, I meant to make other cameos. Like, you mentioned the Enterprise cameo to Shale, but it's also been in one of the, it, it was also on Lorca's desk in his ready room in the first season of Star Trek Discovery. Um, yeah. It was also mentioned, it was also seen in one of the reboot films. Um, also in Star Trek Three, The Search for Spock in the bar scene where McCoy is trying to hitch a ride back to the Genesis planet. So they've made cameos, but there's only been featured in four episodes. So <laughs> trouble with triples, troubles, trials, and tribul- tribulations. Uh, more troubles, more troubles, and the trouble with Edward. Edward. So <laughs> something to do with troubles and troubles and triples. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is like a weird, like a, p- a posed, like question of like so many, so many uh, um, species that are throughout star trek are humanoid or you know at least sentient enough to be communicated with like amongst humans like using communicators and stuff and it's one of these cases of like what about invasive species or exotic species or things that are sort of treated like food chain animals because i mean honest i mean that's kind of just the reality of like animal kingdom existence in the Mm -hmm. universe it's like we know humans and their history of that but that's not really like a very commonly explored theme in star trek of like what about your guys's agriculture and your eating habits of like other creatures because humans do it obviously but uh what about other uh, species and like eating something like a triple are tribbles a food source are they yeah are they predators to something we don't know like did it like w- like what's the how do they exist like how do any animal species exist in an open federation world suddenly where they're being introduced to, like interplanetary like it brings a whole new conversation around exotic species you know like introducing an invasive species to a whole new planet or like a whole new community rather than just like another region on a planet <laughs> That's yeah, a really interesting point. Um, yeah. Especially when you consider that, like, dietarily speaking, like, there is a little bit of exploration into things like the Klingons eating uh, things live, like gah. Um, yeah. Or if you look at the Vulcan planet, like, the majority of Vulcans consider are, are vegetarian uh, yep. because of their own moral implications, but they they had to even evolve to that point. So you're right. Like, I hadn't really considered that that is something that is explored very lightly, but not like, not in terms of like, how do you produce your food? Do you do mass farming? Do you do like heavy agriculture? You know, it's yeah. It's- and like, even with the, the context of like, uh, they have food, you know, we have food synthesizers. I mean, we have, I mean, you can literally use a replicator to make almost any food that you want. And so it's like this whole thing of like, why would you need to even eat a tribble on its own right like can't we just like upload its genetic makeup and make the replicator print it off and we don't have to kill any of these like <laughs> it's like an interesting concept it's like i don't know but i feel like it's a little bit of a loophole to be like no i think i'm pretty sure we could just like upload it like similar to, like 3d printing i'm like here's the genetic uh blueprint of a tribble if you want to eat tribbles 
and we can print it off like and we don't have to actually cut one open and eat one that's actually interesting because going back to the example of Gok, i remember there was an episode of uh next gen where riker's getting ready to go be an envoy on a klingon ship and tries a bunch of different klingon food before he leaves um but as if i recall correctly the the replicator can't produce live Gok; it only produces dead Gok. so can you get live tribbles from a rep- replicator maybe not yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, that's interesting to talk about that because, you know, what, what, what about like when we put triples in an environment that can't handle them? You know, like I'm just thinking of like you put bullfrogs in and like I'm thinking about an episode of The Simpsons, for example. Uh, you know, this is totally not Star Trek, but, you know, I'm thinking about an episode from very early on in, in The Simpsons where uh, they actually smuggled um bullfrogs into the Australian Australian you know frontier you know I just say that uh, and the bullfrogs were eating all their crops I mean you know what what's to prevent you know the tribbles if they were ever on Sherman's planet which was the was was the grain was supposed to be on that planet you drop them off on that planet they eat all the grain you know <laughs> you know it can't handle it you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm thinking about those kind of things, like invasive species that, you know, chew away at other other ecosystems, you know, like 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 that. Or, you know, the emerald ash borer here in Minnesota, for example, mm-hmm. you know, eat, eat all the ash trees, you know, and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Invasive species, you know, they think some people perceive the triples as one. I mean, granted, it's played for laughs in the show, but... <laughs> But, you know, it's I like... I definitely saw that. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, um, no, go ahead. I, I think... All right. Uh, I think we definitely saw that to the extreme in uh, the trouble with Edward as well, like in in making them, uh, you know, genetically modifying so- them so that they could reproduce at such a quick level. Uh, toward the end of the episode, they say, like, we only have a couple of hours until we run out of oxygen because the, the ship is just not going to be able to handle this many triples. Yeah. And then uh, they mentioned the end. They don't show it, which I was a little disappointed by. I was hoping that I would get to see the ship explode and triples just explode into space. Um, but the, like they, they mentioned, oh, yeah, the the ship had a structural failure because of the amount of triples that were on board yeah so uh yeah i think that's definitely the extreme example of what you're talking about and probably why kenzie that it is has mentioned before that they kind of had to taper back on that engineering to make sure that they weren't you know completely negating every planet's environment yeah and even like you you even dabble in how to counteract invasive species like how we introduced uh, beetles to get rid of aphids in uh, in farmland here in the United States and then created a new invasive species with that like they, they kind of dabble in that with the animated series episode where they the Klingons have that uh, glomer that, uh, glomer and uh, you know it's like that it's like kind of short-sighted you know it's like ah this is just gonna like take care of our issue but then it starts not wanting to uh, attack the, the larger piles of tribbles when they're like in their colony size and uh, being like well now you just have bombers chilling out well tribbles are just going to start gathering in larger packs to avoid being eaten so now you've just created a new scenario of issues yeah you mentioned that yeah um you know in that episode the tribbles get bigger and all because apparently Cyrano jones had find a way found a way to make them not reproduce when they ate <laughs> but he just made them bigger <laughs> yeah, uh, I just I'm just thinking about all those gags that were in those four episodes, like like the commercial for Trouble with Edward, or you know, or the ending of Trouble tr- Trials and Tribulations. Um, it's on the Promenade on DS9. You know, all those, <laughs> you know, all those, all those like, and you know, apparently like Ferengi, because uh, <laughs> one's on top of Cork's head. Um, you know, or you know, the the like the sit on the triple, you know, with Kirk sitting on the triple on his on his captain's chair in the very first one, yeah. from, or pushing him off his captain's chair in that episode with the glomers. So <laughs> someday I'll learn. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I love the, the how comical the Deep Space Nine episode of Trials and Tribulations. So I, I just love that whole episode in general. Yeah, I do too. 
the thing that I really loved about the DS9 episode is that, especially since they, you know, cut it together with footage from the original series, it just, it felt like such a love letter to that, to like the older version of Mecha and to the original series in general. Um, just going back to that whole classic, uh, like, like Dax talking about how she just loves that classic design, the black finish with the, with the silver edges and, and just the, oh yeah, the, the uniforms were different and our colors were different, but the spirit of Starfleet was always there. And it, it just, it, it was like warm and fuzzy while also calling back to that same I, I feel like um a lot of the slapstick comedy that came from especially the original triples episodes was definitely part of the show being a product of its time uh being filmed and, and produced in the 60s where you need to throw in those little like side jokes and side gags because you're bringing this crazy dramatic sci-fi scenario to screens it, it's about making it more familiar for your audiences so it was uh really nice to see that repeated in ds9 yeah yeah those episodes like the episode was made to celebrate star trek's 30th anniversary um and i just a little bit of trivia about that they had actually had wanted to go back to the um the uh sigma iosha 2 which was the one with the uh, the chicago uh, a piece of the action episode they originally wanted to do that, you know, thinking of like, okay, McCoy left his communicator down on the planet, you know, what's going to happen in a hundred years, you know, when they come back, you know, and they were concerned about, you know, they were going to involve the fans somehow and do that being a bunch of Trek, be a big, big giant Trek convention. And, <laughs> and it was too expensive for them. And they were also concerned about, you know, uh, fans not acting properly, so I guess that, that was that was, and then that's why they went back to the Tribbles episode. And they had actually, they actually got inspiration from Forrest Gump actually to make that happen. The seamless, um, in the seamless uh, visual effects to put like Dax and Cisco on the bridge of the Enterprise during when yeah. during that scene where he sits on the cap uh, sits on the Tribble. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> And, and you, you gotta admit, uh, yeah, it is one of my favorite favorite episodes of DS9. Is troubles with trouble trials and tribulations, is for that reason. It's all because it's it's just the campiness, you know. It's you know you got a serious season, obviously, um, of season five of DS9. But you know you got this little episode. You know it's fun. It's funny. Yeah. You know, I love I love the, the like going into red alert and he slaps his chest for the com badge and it's just like oh wait <laughs> I'm like that's not hold on like let me pull my communicator I guess. yeah I gotta find out what's going on and uh, Cisco does yeah properly be like hey what's going on I'm like uh, why are you hitting your chest <laughs> I think. Uh... What? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, I think my favorite little uh, callback um, in the DS9 episode is specifically how Worf and the people who are with him react to the look of the original Klingons uh, on K7. Yeah. Uh, and how, like, <laughs> wow, Worf, like, what happened? They look nothing like you. And he just goes, we don't talk about it with outsiders. And that's the only explanation you yeah. get. And, like, there's no, there's no, oh, yeah. <laughs> and no sort of, like, try to cover up the fact that, like, we just didn't have of the makeup mechanics that we do now guys we could i, I love like decorate. subtle almost fourth walling of stuff like that where it's like <laughs> we're not going to acknowledge that we just <laughs> don't talk about this guys <laughs> yeah i know it was that was funny uh you know and, and like it <laughs> you know what's funny about that episode also um about that you know that, that particular scene you're mentioning to shale is um the uh like Bashir goes like those are Klingons uh <laughs> and the bartender thinks that because they just arrived the bartender thinks they're already drunk but now they're <laughs> not and Bashir goes those are Klingons <laughs> and the bartender goes okay you've had you've had you guys have had enough well they just yeah. got there <laughs> and it's funny <laughs> it's funny what about what about the about that episode too what about the scene where uh, Bashir and O'Brien are in the in the in the turbo lift with Lieutenant Watley, and you know Bashir has this whole paradox question in his head, going like, "Watley, I think she was in Starfleet. I could have been my own great great grandfather." Oh my gosh! 
<laughs> I, I kind of like how that was just like a subtle nod to the like hey we're gonna we're gonna reference back to the future as well like we're, yeah. here we are, we're dabbling in every other sort of like <laughs> it's pretty great Might as well throw all the uh, all the all the kishi time travel things into one into one episode and i love how they just didn't explore it any further after that they're like yeah. no we're not even gonna touch this like we're, not, we're going to the station going. and we're, we're not coming back yeah exactly yeah and it's like i like the ending of that scene you know, like fine i'll bet you back, 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 back to, i'll get you back to deep space and if i know you find out i'm not i haven't existed <laughs> or something like that he gets like yeah. so mad at o'brien and you know it's like oh my god it, because he's because he was just chastising him for being ridiculous going like i couldn't meet her tomorrow i never would be born you know oh my gosh uh, it's just it, it, i love that episode it's just so funny all the way through and you know and you were mentioning the whole the whole touching his uh chest uh kenzie earlier like cisco and then dash that at first like dax so gives him like a look if you ever watch that scene you know he does that it's like a second sec a uh, second of silence and then he get, she gives him like a look that's like what you're supposed to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like you're giving us away, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, she gives like a look like, yeah. <laughs> it was like, it was like a big surprise like that. And then she apparently had the hot for Spock, apparently Dax did. So it's like, oh, he's so <laughs> handsome in person. It's like, oh, yeah, and it, it, like Cisco thought he was talking, she was talking about Kirk. And like, no, she goes, no, Spock. <laughs> <laughs> Also, I like that Dax recognizes McCoy because he's like, you know, just it's like, hey, I, I knew him. Like, yeah. <laughs> hey, it's Bones. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. It's because of um, one of her one of her past hosts was uh, judged uh, his gymnastics competition. Yeah. So, like, I just sometimes I was forgetting, like, Dax is like just eternal. <laughs> yeah, we forget that. And it's like, yeah, it's. It's it's funny, you know. I, I, that episode is just funny all the way through. David Gerald actually makes a cameo. He doesn't say anything, but he's in the episode a couple times. So the original writer of Trouble with Tribbles, he's in there a few, a few a couple times. Um, he's in there a couple times, but uh, yeah. But they've like the Tribbles, man. They're cuddly little furballs. <laughs> Just building a little bit on uh, Dax uh, within the sphere of like original series and and on the original Enterprise, I really liked how they kept alluding to Dax and their their very extended lifespan as a trill um, in speaking like, oh yeah, you know, I knew Captain Koloth and he, he used to talk about how he had the chance to like go to blows with Kirk and just like regretted that he never got to actually face him in, in battle. Um, but I, I found it interesting because where everybody is having so much trouble with the earlier technology of, of that century, Dax is, just kind of falls back into it like it's a habit. Yeah. And I thought that was a really cool, um, like she she played it so well. The, like she made herself look so comfortable in the old uniform and using the old technology and, you know, fun at Cisco and at, uh, you know, O'Brien when they couldn't figure out, you know, things like the, the turbo lift or um, the, the communicators as well. Um, it just felt like a really good touch on the actress's part to just kind of show like oh yeah no I've been here before like this is fine um, and also just funny to watch everybody else struggle so much and thinking like oh yeah you know if we got sent back 100 150 years in the past we'd probably struggle with the technology of that oh yeah as well. <laughs> and that's where it just shows that the eternalness of Dax like just like she holds a lot of information as a, a being that's existed for so long and actually plays well with it like it's awesome yeah that's awesome yeah yeah definitely Terry Farrell played that very well um they played they, like she knew the stuff already you know and you know it's funny that you know but you know when they were planning this stuff like a little bit more trivia here about troubles and tr trials and tribulations um most of the actors, most of the cast of DS9 didn't know how to use those props. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. They did not know. So uh, Walter Koenig, who was around the area at the time, he came to Paramount and actually showed them how to use it. Like they use how to use the communicators and stuff like that. So that's why it was pretty much flawless for them. You know, <laughs> but I mean, using like the communicators and stuff like that, you know, like flipping up right and stuff like that. That was all Koenig teaching them how to use it. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all Koenig. That perfect, 
perfect wrist flick or you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna have a bounce back on you <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah so yeah I just, I, the, just like the background like even just like talking about tribbles in general and like those episodes but that episode itself like was not only just an awesome nod to the tribbles but also just like an actual production gem like and how they try to stay true to like like setting up the set and that uh, they mm-hmm. they like i had read somewhere that um their reactions to seeing um enterprise for the first time as they entered it were genuine because they weren't shown on the set beforehand and they just oh. got to walk in and see them and be like wow <laughs> it does feel like we're actually on the enterprise now like this is awesome and then the way that they actually cut the film was like done specially to make sure that it blended well with the old like film so like instead of filming it the way they usually would they actually used like real videotape (laughs) like using reels to like actually like you know make it look seamless Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that. Like the thing that I noticed immediately from a production standpoint, as soon as they went from um, the Defiant to the Enterprise A, uh, they the lighting was just so different. I, I remember just watching it and being like, oh man, you know, DS9, it's like, it's like mid 90s TV. So mm-hmm. it's like super dark and really dingy. And like anytime you're actually on DS9, it's like, it's just very uh, like, there's a lot of gray, uh, a lot of browns and grays and just it's, it's very subdued. And then as soon as they were on the Enterprise, like the gray walls bright. looked almost like purple. They were so bright and like just the uniforms were basically glowing with those colors. I thought it was, it was really interesting how they differentiated timelines using their lighting and in yeah. not the sets but also just how they how they filmed everything in a more classic like 60s way yeah that's a good a good ode for the 30th anniversary like i mean that's just like awesome to do that like that was, yeah that was 30th anniversary right yes 30th anniversary yeah, I'm, yep. like, I'm like trying to think i'm like yeah that would be 30th anniversary yeah yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I think that's definitely a great way to nod back to the original series. Like, for something that only shows up a handful of times, I love how iconic triples are. Like, it's just such a cool, like, random thing to have as sort of a face of Star Trek, especially for people who aren't really into Star Trek, that that's something that they can totally identify and be like, hey, that's really awesome. Like, I know what that is. I don't know the context of triples, but I know what a triple is. <laughs> yeah so yeah definitely um yeah i like the like you know yeah i don't know what else to say about them other than a cute little fuzzy furball fuzzy furballs uh do any of you guys have a do you, any of you guys have tribbles i do i have a um i have one that's uh it's basically just a, a bunch of fur that's <laughs> so <Yeah>. <laughs> um my dad when i was growing up he had one that actually had like a sound chip in it so it would purr when you like shook it oh and um, a little <laughs> yeah, oh that so is cute, cute. But, yeah that's awesome yeah but mine doesn't purr unfortunately so <laughs> yeah i don't know i i don't know if i should mention this but i think the furbies you know the furby things you know that were around in the 90s and 2000s weren't they based on triples no you know it just i would not be surprised yeah yeah Yeah, because i I watched i watched a movie i watched like a movie recently that had come out that was about like an alien invasion and the aliens were straight up triples i'm like is this like a nod to them except they had like crazy tongue things to like attach them to stuff and move around but it was so weird because i was like watching it and i'm like these are just straight up floating tribbles like i don't even like what the heck like i'm like is that what this is based off of or is this based off of the original like story like that tribbles are even based off of like i i'm kind of confused yeah 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 that's that's interesting uh i never heard of that um (laughs) i don't know the name of the movie you're mentioning but uh yeah that's interesting that you know, it's called just, say yeah save yourselves mm-hmm. that was the movie oh i've never heard of that so yeah it came out in 2020 but uh, it was like i'm like what the heck i'm like it's just straight up triples yeah that's crazy uh yeah you know, that like it's triples with tongues apparently apparently according to like right as you said right it was like yeah <laughs> troubles with tongues. I, I I just thought it was kind of funny to be like uh, like everyone being like, are these troubles? Or is everybody wondering about it, but it's like everybody was kind of confused of, about like what they were supposed to look like because that's what everybody asked right away, being like, 
Yeah, no, like I one of the first like headlights I'd seen from like sci-fi wire was something like, no furry aliens in that are not tribbles. <laughs> like, come on, guys. <laughs> tribbles don't have faces. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like, and they're faceless, but it's just like a random like tongue thing that can just like impale you. And I'm like, well, no, yeah, I'm like, because tribbles are harmless to people, except for their just abundance. But it's like actually they're they're actually violent. So but that's like right away I'm like, that's that's a tough uh approach if you're just gonna put like a furry ball uh (laughs) alien coming to earth i'm like everyone's gonna go oh my gosh it's triples i'm like there's way more of an impactful like culture thing around around triples that i think they expected and they had to like constantly reiterate that i'm like these are this is nothing to do with star trek or triples like (laughs) seriously oh no (laughs) but hey you know it's fine you know they got you know it's that just means that they are iconic, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's like, I was like, oh, to Star Trek for making such an iconic character because that's literally a perfect example of that. Yeah, it's just, it's just that's just their staying power, you know? Um, it's a, kudos to David Gerald, you know, pretty much, you know? You know, it, it's pretty much kudos to him, you know, without him. You know, writing the original trouble, the trouble with triples back in the '60s. <laughs> I mean, we mean, you know, have them. Who, we, we wouldn't have the them. iconic we alien would yeah. be then. Yeah, yeah, we got like, well, like, like I said, six iconic races of Star Trek. That's one of them. The other ones are Klingons, yeah. Romulans, Vulcans, and Borg. So yeah, maybe they, even Andorians, but maybe depending and, on like where where you fall and what you've seen. But I feel like. When people see aliens, depending on how the yeah. aliens look, they're like, it's probably Star Trek. Like, especially pointy ears, it's like Star Trek. Yeah. Uh, blue antenna, probably Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and um, I don't know if you guys have seen this at all. I saw this a lot on social media in the last few years. A mirror universe triple. It's red and it's got these like, it's like a Muppet, like a Muppet, like fangs and stuff like that. Have you guys ever seen that? It's like what a really, it like a mirror universe triple. It's like a red. It, it, it's like it's red, and it's got like fangs, and it's like it's like they call it a mirror universe triple, obviously. But it was like a giant Muppet. <laughs> oh, that's cool. I, I, I've seen, yeah. I've seen, I've seen it. I mean, and it's like they call it. Oh, this is. Oh called yeah, a- I I'm just looking it up right now, and I'm like, oh man, start with <laughs> mirror universe triples. <laughs> Yeah, well, they are it, vicious but adorable. Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> red spiky hair. <laughs> yeah, red and it's got like fangs gosh, and it's got and it's it's yeah it's red and fangs and stuff like that. Um, it's just that's what it, it, it they call it mirror universe triple. Like you know, speaking like, everything, so uh, everything's so much more bitey and scary in the mirror universe. I love it. It's just <laughs> like a just like a complete opposite like imagine anything that you like and now you'll hate it in the mirror universe <laughs> okay but what if we took any object and made it edgier yeah pretty much <laughs> i'm like so what about things that are uh, like inherently terrible in our universe do they just become amazing in in the mirror universe or like a like a not so much a mirror but like an opposite reflection of you or do they just get worse? I'm like, I don't know. I think some of the bad episodes of Star Trek are good in the on the, in the alternate universes, like episodes. Like, I'm just gonna mention, like you you asked that question. I'm just gonna answer your question, Kenzie. Um, I I think some of the worst episodes of Star Trek episodes, like Threshold, for example, from Voyager, they're probably amazing in the alternate universes. Who yeah. in the multiverse? <laughs> but it's like so funny because for considering the the way that people think about tribbles and like and that they're supposed to be kind of like inherently bad here by their abundance like wouldn't the opposite of that be that they're like underabundant or because they're bad they're bad in this universe so like (laughs) i don't know (laughs) they have the opposite problem they are small vicious and reproduce like once every 10 years yeah (laughs) yeah i'm like that's the only way i can picture i'm like because they're kind of inherently bad anyway so how do you mirror that oppositely in the mirror universe so just uh they're they're just uh they're just some archaic creature that like a cryptid where there's like one or two of them and they're just vicious 
that or maybe they eat their young and it, it just yeah it's like a slightly like the faster thing. race rate than they reproduce them or something. yeah they eat their young quicker than they can reproduce so <laughs> that's terrifying <laughs> That is terrifying. Yeah, that if if it was if it was like that, yeah, yeah. So it's it's fun, you know, talking about this, you know. But uh, I don't know what else to say. I'm kind of speechless I right had, now. I had a, a thought while I was watching, specifically the animated series. Uh, episode, oh yeah, of course. Um, because I, I did a little brushing up before before the episode here, and uh, I was watching it last night, and I noticed that. I remember um, I, I didn't watch the entirety of the animated series because I had a lot of trouble getting through it. I felt like it was uh, production wise, it was very just hard for me to kind of immerse myself in and get the same enjoyment as I did from the live series. Uh, that said, um, I noticed one thing that I found extremely funny in the tri- uh, the triple episode, which was when you watch Scotty. Uh, beam Cyrano Jones onto um, the Enterprise yeah. there's a cut from looking at Scotty to looking at the transporter pad like from Scott like from like a second person view of Scotty yeah and Scotty has a mustache for no reason they just added <laughs> a mustache to Scotty so you just see like the edge of like a curly mustache and then when it cuts back to look at him it's gone that's so I don't weird know who animated that that like frame or like those like 10 frames of scotty the animation discrepancies like, decided somebody to somebody really wanted to see scotty with a curly mustache and they're just like hey, what's going to do like he's going to you know put that on there yeah i understand to shale i mean more troubles more troubles was actually planned for season 3 of the original of the original series actually oh interesting yeah because um i actually have the animated series on dvd and david gerald did a commentary on it for for that set i think it's on the blu-ray set now i mean because all the stuff that was on that dvd transferred over to the blu-ray set that came out a few years ago and i remember that gerald had said that they were going to do this for season three of the original series and then fred freiberger who was the producer said star trek's not a comedy we're not going to do it so (laughs) i know i know i mean why would you i mean if it had been done in the original series it would have been interesting to see obviously but it would have been fun to see that happen you know like all this stuff that happened in more triples more troubles would they have made a glomer like with the low budget they had for season three of the original series because because the budget got cut a lot when they got moved from the original night which was on I think it was on Tuesday nights on NBC to Friday nights for the third for the third season when the budget got cut and stuff like that. And you know, it's like, would they have made it? I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I, I heard him do the commentary on it once, and I said that this was originally planned for season three of the original series, and then Fred Bright Fireburgers just put the kibosh on it, and that's why season three sucks. But <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I think season three of TOS sucks. Um, except for a few episodes here and there, like like the Dolan Web. But um, but that's what I understand about more troubles, more troubles. And it's like, yeah, I get why people can't get early into the animated show. I mean, because it is, I mean, the animation is very dated. The animation is very reused and stuff like that. Um. And stuff like that. Music always constantly reused. Um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I and I've I've watched the original series, uh, the anime series through and through. I mean, there are a lot of good concepts in there that were utilized later on, like like the say lot or or you know from that was mentioned in Enterprise that was seen in Enterprise actually, or. Um, you know, things from Vulcan mythology, stuff like that, were, were mentioned in the animated show, but then made it canon and Enterprise because they wanted to connect the dots. So, um, but I think the whole ridiculous, because Gene Roddenberry has said it wasn't canon when he was around. And then I consider it canon now because I think anything that CBS, Viacom CBS owns now for Star Trek yeah. is canon. So... <laughs> You know, so that's what I think. I, but I totally understand the whole, uh, whole conversation of that. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah we I had a part. Like, sorry, <laughs> I definitely count it as uh, like part of the canon, like for sure. It's just, um, it's one of those where 
it's kind of funny because people who know enough about star trek to pick up on like the fact that like my name is a vulcan name and they're 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 out there you know there are plenty of people who um who will have no idea where my name comes from and then they'll have a lot of people who are like oh my god is your name vulcan um and it's interesting because those same people will tend to think that I'm like this huge super fan who knows like everything about Star Trek. And I have to sit here and be like, well, actually, I only really like, you know, TNG and TOS, but like, I, I like all of it, but I'm not like, I'm not memory alpha, you know, I don't have all yeah. of the information <laughs> that you're looking for about like every series. And like, it's, it's those same kind of people like we were talking about earlier, where it's like, okay, where do you draw the lines of canon what how do you decide like what is actually part of the universe and what's fan yeah. fiction or what's you know just fan fandom yes and i agree with you tishel like wait like, grant i think probably between the three of us i'm probably the big super fan here uh, <laughs> uh the podcast so yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh, because i enjoy talking star trek with people i do and that's why i asked kennedy to join me this time around because i did one before but I I, I kind of hated doing it by myself. <laughs> I wanted someone to boss off of. <laughs> That's why I have Kenzie on my on this on this version on this Twin Cities Trekkies podcast now, is because of that. It's something to bo- someone to bounce off of, but also help me too. You know, like you know, you know, you know. I just want to be able to talk about it with somebody every every yeah. so often. <laughs> but I like I said, but- have more of a conversation than like an inner monologue. <laughs> <laughs> exactly and and that's how i feel and um and that's how i feel now like you know definitely i like doing that bouncing off of each other but like i said between the three of us i'm probably the big super fan here because <laughs> i i mean i do re i look up memory alpha once in a while i also got memory, memory beta at once in a while and that's also for yeah. the non that's also the non-canon stuff yeah i mean you know I know this much. I like, feel like like certain things that you like. I mentioned this on a previous episode to Shale, but with regarding spoilers and stuff like that, I don't really care um, about them, about certain upcoming shows or something like that, because it, it helps me enjoy you a dig lot. Dig in, more. no matter what, you're gonna dig in even if it gets spoiled. <laughs> exactly. So I'm just thinking about. And I didn't mean to. I forgot to mention this before. Was like like there was uh, the red matter in the first Star Trek reboot film. Yep. Um, and um, I remember reading the Star Trek Countdown comic, which was a four-part miniseries that dealt with what happened, why did Spock and Nero travel back to the 23rd century and, you know, create this whole new timeline. And, you know, and I remember reading about it. I'm going like, oh, this actually helps me understand the movie a little bit better. <laughs> so, yeah, but that's yeah, that's like, It's cool to use, like... What memory alpha be like oh non-canon but like actually just i mean i i say a lot of uh, some amazing star trek content is made by people who write books or have little comics or people who write short stories or even fan fiction and stuff i i've loved reading so much content around star trek whether or not it's written by the og folk that produce and write for it like mm-hmm. it's just cool to see where people's people's ideas go with Star Trek because that's the beauty of being optimistic about the future and what does that entail. And people are great at constructing based off of canon or the timeline that exists. Really cool scenarios and what if situations. Yeah, def- like, uh, yeah, oh, definitely. Sorry. Go, <laughs> go ahead. Like Star Trek- <laughs> Uh, is a really good avenue for creative ideas like that as well because it's so easy to take the the very basic like oh yeah you know there's a starship and we're traveling and we found a planet and we found something absolutely new you know we found a new civilization or we found like a different alien species or this planet is really weird in some way and because it's so open-ended but structured at the same time it's a great way for especially like I remember when I was in middle school and you know I was just trying to start my hand like trying my hand at writing and like that's that's how you start out you you write what you know and you gain experience from there and I feel like it's a really good avenue for bringing your own ideas to life in a way that asks questions about it you know Mm -hmm. where you have to okay if you're going to make this planet if you're going to make this new thing you're also going to have to make it interact 
with the characters that we know and, and Starfleet and, you know, the way that we know their technology works. And I think that's uh, what's really cool. And one of the reasons that I, I love not only Star Trek as a concept, but as a fandom as well, because it's, and it carries through because also, fun fact, the shale runs Dungeons and Dragons campaigns. And <laughs> one of my, one of our good friends, uh, our, our uh, parental situation of who has, uh, <laughs> um, who takes care of Kurt during the week and on the weekends, <laughs> who, who is visitation rights. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, play D&D campaigns and stuff too. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's one of the beauties of being able to explore like and expand on headcanon for any fandom and be able mm-hmm. to write a story beyond that absolutely yeah definitely yeah so yeah so so to show you said you've done that stuff have you done anything like you know regarding like fan fiction or you know fan art because i know a lot of people that i've seen on social media like to protest like, like, like not protest i mean display their art their star trek art um over like you know like that kind of thing uh, I... yeah i mean a, a lot of my stuff that is specifically was trek related is uh, a lot older stuff that i was doing while i was in school you know um i i've definitely continued to create in, in my adult life but it has definitely not been as much uh it is i think always an a subject matter that i will come back to as i do continue to create in my life you know as i you know i paint i draw i write um and there, it's always one of those things that like you know if i don't have inspiration i can kind of fall back on on these ideas and these characters that i really love there's a there's a really nice um sort of comfort in that yeah yeah uh, yeah that, that's awesome i'm glad to hear that uh you know you know because you know like when Kenzie I did an episode about fandom, I know I did start, start stuff like that. I did fan fiction, stuff like that. Um, uh, I still did when I was in college too. Like that's why I kind of have an English degree. So um, <laughs> I kind of have a creative writing degree because of that. Um, I mean, because I wanted to be a writer for Star Trek originally. I wanted to be that, you know. I mean, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Captain Picard. I know I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think because, everybody, I think, because yeah. I, I grew up during the, I grew up when TNG was on. So, um, you know, it was still in first run. So, um, so I enjoyed being yeah, and on. Then, I had the perfect thing of being like a girl growing up and seeing it Janeway as a captain while I was growing up. And that was amazing to me because I'm like, yeah, this lady is badass. And also, she loves coffee and I started drinking coffee and I was like nine. So I'm just like, dude, same. I would go to a nebula if there's coffee in that nebula. I would too. <laughs> yeah, I there's... feel the same way about uh, Earl Grey. I, I, I had never tried it before and I was like, you know what? It's here. I'm going to try it because Picard would want me to. And I, <laughs> he I would want me to. <laughs> all the time. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So you say you're, you're drinking Earl Grey to shale? Oh, all love the time. I love Earl Grey it. tea. Oh, yeah. And Lady and that, Grey tea is very nice too. If you want a little twist on the the bergamot orange combo, Ooh. oh, it's just yeah, way. bergamot tea has been mentioned a few times in Star Trek. I know that, but uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm just gonna say I am sorry, but I've tried it. Not a big fan. Oh. So. <laughs> And, 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 it's, it's a strong yeah. acquired taste <laughs> it, it, tea is definitely an acquired taste like if you have not had tea and you taste it it's like oh i don't want to feel about this so like mm-hmm. same with coffee any sort of drink like that it definitely uh mm-hmm. gotta have a taste for it yeah and totally um uh, you know i love iced tea which was a drink of captain archer don't get me wrong i love iced tea but I just don't like Earl Grey. I tried it once a few years ago. I abs- I did not like it at all. And it's nothing that the people that made it or anything like that, or the two of you who have enjoyed it or, or anybody else who enjoys Earl Grey, I'm just not a big fan of it. So, yeah, it's probably, it's definitely like, a, like Earl Grey with the bergamot oil. Like that's definitely like, it's a big thing. Like it's this black tea with bergamot. And then Lady Grey tea was a little more of like, you might you might like Lady Grey tea because that like it it's um it's less bergamotty ah. and it's a lot lighter so it has lemon and orange in it. Oh, that's not a little bad. more. It was like I think it was made for a more Scandinavian market to be like less strong because <laughs> it's like infamously like more of like a British thing to have like a stronger tea. 
so I know that was like a big deal like at least it's like twinings or twinnings or whatever like their their tea brand specifically like twinings does it so something to try yeah exactly because it yeah uh, sorry, if we're talking about uh, Star Trek beverages, though, we definitely can't forget the Warriors beverage, the most iconic beverage in Star Trek, prune juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 Star Trek beverages. Oh, we could go a little bit about that, just a little bit, yeah. The Warriors yeah. drink. Yeah, Warriors drink, yeah, prune juice, you know. <laughs> you know, what's funny is that, you know, Worf drank it, he loved it, and then when he gets the DS9 for the first time, and Cork goes, let me guess, Klingon Budwine. And he tells him prune juice. And then Cork just laughs at him. <laughs> Seriously, he doesn't understand. He's like, dude, guys, this is an amazing drink. Like, why is not everybody else drinking this? You should be proud of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, prune juice is good for old people, but, you know, it's okay, too. I mean, I drink I it like once it. in a while. I like it, too. You know, it, it's all good. It's, I mean, I think I drank it because Warp did it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm like you know more thinks it's a warrior's drink I why not I me a drink. Yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> you know but they're like you know some other things of star trek beverages that you know you know i'm not sure if i want to try but i would want to try anyway because like playing on yeah. blood wine or the war nog or um I'm your nail. A, another episode topic here yeah. that we should definitely cover is the food and drink of Star Trek. Yeah, definitely. I would love to that. So oh, we are talking about tr- eating triples anyway. I'm like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> might as Give well. <laughs> Let's start going down that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, fuzzy meatballs or cereal, fuzzy cereal. <laughs> what did yeah. he, uh, in Trip with Edward, he compared them to scallops, I think is what he said. Yeah. <laughs> Red meat scallops. I'm not sure. Red I'm not sure scallops. what to make of that. <laughs> yeah. So furry tickles. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Kenzie. We can definitely revisit that topic eventually. The food and drink of Star Trek. That is definitely something that we can definitely talk about because I know that based on what things worked like in the 60s, it's all like these Play-Doh cubes, and you know, then you get the next generation, and it's like real food. <laughs> yeah or when like voyager when it's like real food being made by neelix um you know and stuff like that you know it's the yeah, yeah it's like some of those foods i'm going like i don't know if i want to try that you know because <laughs> they like they make because they, they build it up to like be so disgusting and you know they go like it's like yeah they, do i really want to eat that do I really want to be in Starfleet if I want to eat that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. I think we should wrap this up. Is there anything else you two want to share or anything like that about triples or anything? I think i'm all set i really appreciate you guys having me on the show yeah, yeah told- so awesome having yeah you. totally to show um where can people find you if you want to interact with our listeners uh well they can find me mainly on facebook actually <laughs> um, <laughs> i don't have a lot of social media um but that is probably the best place to look me up all right that's awesome well, uh, thank you for joining us today, Tishiel. I really do appreciate you coming on on such short notice, too. <laughs> yes, it was great. Yeah. You can find Twin Cities Trekkies on many different platforms. You can find it on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. You can also send us a voice message at anchor.fm slash Twin Cities Trekkies, or you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash TC Trekkies Pod, or on Instagram, the same handle is TC Trekkies Pod, or you can send us an email at TC Trekkies Podcast at gmail.com. I guess until next time, take care and live long and prosper. Live long and prosper.